We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church family. Great to see you all. Before we get into that, I can clarify a couple things that Charlotte was talking about. Uh, one, you don't have to do that apologetics course in order. You could do session three before you do session one. Do that whenever you're ready, but it's an incredible program. And also, at fourth service, she said there's no ACC kids zone 4.5. So that's our fourth and fifth graders. Everyone else, we do have ACC kids on Wednesday nights. So hopefully you can be a part of that. So got, uh, grab a copy of God's Word. Uh, if you don't own one, just grab one in the chair in front of you and write your name in it. So now we all have a Bible, and let's turn to Colossians chapter 2 together. We're going to learn from Colossians chapter 2. But while you're opening up your Bibles, I want to tell you a story. When I was in college, I traveled with a traveling improv comedy group. And so on the weekends, we would go up and down the East Coast, and we put on clean improv comedy shows in different churches. And I loved it so much that when I, my wife and I got married after I graduated, we decided we were going to open up an improv comedy club in downtown Lynchburg, Virginia. And so I found a landlord and I found the place that we were going to do this. It was a really great old building, three stories. There was going to be like there was a, an old stage area. And so it was going to be really cool. And so we started planning. We had kind of a, a deal in place that we were going to open this thing up by a certain date. I started auditioning people and, and chose a team, and we started practicing. It was an incredible opportunity, so I was excited about what we were going to be doing. And uh, it ended up that this landlord was just completely uh, a, a deceiver. Like every single deadline that came, it went. Every single time he said, we're going to do this, uh, nothing would happen. I'd pop into the building to see progress. Nothing was happening. And throughout the whole thing, I eventually realized that this person was just a, a deceiver. I took them at their word. And uh, have you ever noticed that we as people, we tend to trust people at their word? If somebody comes and says they're going to do something, we just kind of assume they're going to do it. Some of you are like, nah, I've, I've fallen for that too many times. I don't trust nobody no more, right? But in general, we, don't, we have a hard time processing why someone would say, hey, you're going to be able to use this space and we're going to have it ready in a month or in two months, and then they don't do anything. And so I was completely deceived. I fell for it. Apparently, this guy had been doing this, had a history of doing this with other people. And if I had done a little bit of research, I would have known not to go into business with this guy. But here's the deal. Paul is writing to the church in Colossae, and he's, he's essentially saying to them, there are people who are coming into your circle, and they're lying to you. They're telling you things that aren't real, that aren't true, and I want to make sure that you don't fall for it. And here's the big lie, right? The big lie essentially was that you need Jesus, which is truth, but then they added to it that you need Jesus plus this other thing, or you need Jesus plus this and plus that. And if you have everything, then you have everything you need. You see, the truth is that Paul wants the church in Colossae to know is that all you need is Jesus, we just sang that song, right? My hope is found in nothing less. You could also sing, my hope is found in nothing more. My hope is found in Jesus. You have to have Jesus. Anything less, you don't have what it takes to, to be restored and right standing with God. But really, you don't need to add anything. Jesus is sufficient. That's what the letter is all about to this church. And so we're going to look at that together. And in fact, let's look at verse, we're going to be looking at uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 15 together this morning. Let's look at those first two, verses 4 and 5. Paul says, I am telling you this so that no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. If you circle things in your Bible or underline things, circle that phrase, well-crafted arguments. It says, for though I am far away from you, my heart is with you, and I rejoice that you are living as you should, and that your faith in Christ is strong. 
Listen, I, I promise you parents, if you go up and grab your kids from ACC Kids after the service and they walk down with some sort of craft in their hand, say some uh, popsicle sticks that have been glued together into some shape, you're not going to think to yourself that, that that craft put itself together, right? You're going to recognize that your kids, maybe with the help of an adult, but there were some hands involved in putting that craft together. These, these, these arguments, are, it says, are well crafted. Somebody formed them. Someone created them. And, and they're so good, they're such uh, decent fakes that they actually appear to be real. Paul's saying the things that, I'll, I'll, I'll great, give you a great example. When I was in high school, we used to do mission trips every spring break. My high school group, we'd go down to Mexico and we'd serve for the week. And on the way back, we would stop at this marketplace in Tijuana, and we'd go shopping with whatever souvenir money we brought with us. And all of the guys on the trip would go and we'd buy a pair of Oakleys for $8. Now listen, we knew that these weren't real Oakleys. We knew that they, they couldn't possibly have access to all these Oakleys that they're selling for eight bucks, but we didn't care because they looked like the real thing. You put it on and you felt like you were wearing a really expensive pair of sunglasses, and so we were excited to pay eight dollars for Oakleys, okay? And so we were excited about this, but here's the deal. These, these lies that are being passed around the Church of Colossae, they, they seem like the real thing. They sound real, they look real. And so, so Paul is saying, listen, I want to help you figure out how to tell uh, the truth from the lies, how to not be so easily deceived. And so what he's going to lay out here is essentially what you need to do to not be deceived. Now, now listen, we remember these arguments are well-crafted. Speaking of which, well-crafted, that points us all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. What it says, the servant, not the servant, the serpent, Satan, how does it describe him? Was very crafty. He's the one who puts together these well-crafted arguments. He's the one who is seeking to deceive. And so we want to have a fine-tuned eye that can tell the lies from the truth. So Paul lays out here what I would call four steps to avoid being deceived. And so if you're taking notes this morning, here's the first thing that you want to do if you don't want to be deceived. Number one is become unoffendable. Become unoffendable. Now you're thinking, well, what does that mean? I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few word pictures. Imagine for a moment that you're uh, the offensive front line on a football team, right? So you got your quarterback behind you, and you want, for, with all of your strength and all of your might, you want to give that quarterback as much time to do what that quarterback needs to do. You don't want anyone getting to him, tackling him, or anything like that. So if you're at the front line here, right, you're going to get low and lower your center of gravity. You're going to get your cleats, you know, kind of right into the, the ground as, as firmly playing. You're going to get a proper stance. You want to do everything you can in that moment to not be knocked over. As soon as that quarterback says, hike, you're going to try to stand your ground and block without getting knocked over for as long as you can. You want to be unoffendable. You have to, you have to do some things to put yourself in a posture where you don't get knocked down. If, another thing that comes to my mind is, is the concept of a bully. You know, I want you to repeat this. The world is a bully. Will you say that? The world is a bully. The, the strategy of this world is to try to stand big and, and loud, and we can get a lot of people to say the same thing and to scream it down at you. Eventually, we just get bullied into submission, and we believe things that aren't even real. Well, enough people have said it. They're saying it loud. They're threatening violence. They're going to take uh, you know, me and, and put me in the, the toilet if I don't listen. And so we just say, oh, all right, I submit. I'll, I'll just go with whatever you say. You want my milk money? Here it is. And we just hand it over. If we want to become unoffendable, what it simply means is we need to learn how to stand up against the lies, how to stand strong and not be knocked over by them. Here's how Paul puts it in verse 6. He says, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. He says, Let your roots 
grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. And then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. You notice some key words in this passage right here where where Paul is saying, listen, if you want to be strong, there's some things that have to happen before you're strong. It says, then you will be strong. So what do we got to do to become unoffendable? If I want to be strong like an oak tree where I can't be knocked over, what do I got to do? Well, it says you got to let your roots grow down into him and then be built upon him. You see what's underneath all the dirt around us, right? You dig down, you're going to find yourself some bedrock, and we want our roots to grow down into that bedrock, to, be, to grow down into him and then be built and attached and wrapped around. We want our, our roots to be strong. And when that happens, it says, and we can above ground grow strong and become unoffendable, not getting bullied around by the wind, not getting pushed over. You'll notice that it even says in there, once you've accepted Christ, you must continue to follow him. What does that mean? You see, you put a seed in the ground and it, it takes root and the little roots sprout, but nothing else happens. The roots don't grow deep and nothing, you know, eventually that we, we learn in Matthew, right? That that's going to get the, the parable of the seeds. That's not going to go anywhere. We want our roots to grow deep. In other words, we need to give our lives to Jesus, but then we need to continue taking next steps. What is the next thing you need to do so that your, gro- your roots are growing deep and attaching to Jesus? Let me show you uh, from another one of Paul's letters to the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. You picturing like this concept of a tree that doesn't have a lot of strength to it. It's, a, it's being tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. It says we will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like truth. Here's the truth, church. There are going to be winds of false doctrine in your life. You are going to experience lies. You're going to experience persecution. There's a world out there that is, there's, Satan is, has been called the prince of this world, and he is also the prince of lying. He, he's lying. That's all he does. And so you're going to experience deceit. You're going to experience people lying to you. You're going to experience ideas that aren't real, that aren't true. And so we need to have this position, this unoffendable position where our roots have gone deep, attached to the truth of who God is, and so that our our tree is growing strong. And when these winds come and blow against us, which they're going to, you don't just get knocked over by every single thing you hear. You're just believing and falling for all of it. We have to become unoffendable. There's a, uh, a project that, uh, that some scientists did called the Biosphere 2 Project. Anybody here at Biosphere 2? The, the concept was they built this big biodome, this big dome with glass, right? And they created like an, like tried to create like an ideal e- ecosystem within this dome, you know, where all the things are kind of protected from the big bad outside world and see if we can control the elements to a place where there's just like, we got the, our own little ecosphere going on here. Well, what they noticed is that the trees inside the Biosphere 2 project, they would grow really, really quickly. But then they would also die very, very quickly. They grew up really quick, but then they, they didn't have any strength. They, they ended up giving out real quick, and they would fall over. And, and what, There was no wind inside this biosphere. And so one of the things they, they ultimately learned in the end is that wind actually helps trees grow faster. Or not faster, trees, a wind helps trees grow stronger. That when the wind is coming and pushing against the tree, the tree actually you know, hunkers down and says, you know what? It learns how to have deep roots and and wide roots that are built upon the the bedrock. And ultimately, in doing so, the tree grows stronger because of the wind. And in this this Biosphere 2 project, there was no wind, and so the trees were weak. You see, we are going to experience winds of false teaching. We need to 
to let, when, when that comes in, when those ideas come in, instead of them offending us and pushing us over and knocking us down and bullying us, we need to learn how to stand strong and actually be strengthened when we're challenged in our faith. We need to become unoffendable. I wrote down some practical things we can do that you could consider doing if you're not already doing these things in your, in your faith. Number one, obviously, spending time in God's word, spending time in prayer. These are ways that you're going to grow deep roots that are attached to God. Spending time in worship, like what we're doing right now when we gather together with brothers and sisters in Christ in corporate worship. There's something strengthening about these gatherings that allow you to grow deeper roots in your faith. You think of things like fellowship, like gathering together with other believers where you can encourage and strengthen each other. You imagine a tree, a young tree out all by itself. That thing's going to get knocked all over by the wind. But you put a tree in a grove and you're able to see that all of them are going to experience a little bit of wind, but they help each other stand strong and grow stronger. Maybe you need to be in fellowship and you're not in fellowship right now in a life group. You know, one of the, the best ways you can grow deep roots and, and grow strong in your faith to become unoffendable is to start serving, to simply model Jesus. Jesus was the ultimate servant. You know, actors, when they're trying to get into character, like three months, six months before a film even starts filming, they, they start this process of learning the, the, the mindset of the character they're going to be playing. They start acting like that character, thinking and talking like that character, and really trying to get into the, the brain of that character. So when they're, they're on set and that director says action, they're able to really act like and be that person for a temporary amount of time. One of the best ways you can grow deep roots that are connected to the heart of God is to imitate him. And if Jesus served in a way that none of us could even imagine, right, giving his life for us on the cross, one of the ways you can grow deep roots that are connected to him, built on him, is simply by saying, I want to serve. I want to be like Jesus. Another thought before I move on to the second thing is... If you've seen, a, imagine a young tree again. A, it doesn't have deep roots yet. Its, its trunk is not very big. And you put it out all by itself in the middle of a windstorm. That poor thing is going to get destroyed. And so parents, one of your responsibilities is, is to think when you have your children to, that you don't throw them out to the wolves before they're ready with deep roots and a strong trunk to become unoffendable in their faith. Sometimes we say, you know, I'm going to take my kid who doesn't really have any of the, the roots they need to stand strong, and I'm just going to put them in a situation where they're getting slapped around by the wind and false teachings, and they start believing these things because they don't have the roots yet in place. And so one of our responsibilities as parents is to make sure, especially within the home, that we're helping them grow these deep roots. They're going to experience lies and deceit, and we, we don't want to protect them from all the wind because the wind will make them stronger, but we certainly want to make sure that we are putting them in a proper amount of wind until their roots are strong. Does that make sense? All right, here's the second thing. You want to avoid being deceived. You want to compare every message you hear to the Word of God. Compare every idea that comes in your head, every thought that you have, everything you hear on TV, uh, just take it and say, what does God's word say about this and how does it compare? Let's look at Colossians 2 verse 8, 9 and 10. It says, don't let anyone compare you, oh, sorry, cap don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. So this, ver these, this passage tells us a few things. One, it reminds us that Jesus Christ is the ultimate ruler and authority. He's over every ruler and every authority. So whatever Jesus says goes. Right? That's the ultimate say. But it also reminds us that there are these empty philosophies and high-sounding, they sound right, they look real, high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking. It might come from your own mind or someone else's around you. 
And in many cases, they come from the spiritual powers of this world. They're supernatural. In, in, this, uh, in this world that we live in, there's a whole supernatural element that your eyes can't see. There's evil, there's demons, there's angels, there's, there's, there's battles happening around us. And one of the things you have to understand and, and recognize is that Satan and his demons, they want to deceive you. They want to throw out these lies, these well-crafted arguments. And so some of the lies, uh, you know, Paul says, is they come from spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ. So what do we do? If Jesus is the ultimate word on any topic... What we simply do is we take everything we hear, we compare it to God's word where he's already spoken, and we see if there is an answer that comes out on the other end. We filter it through God's word. One of my, my favorite authors and pastors, his name's Francis Chan, and one of the videos that he, uh, video devotional I watched, he, he's talking about how um, in, in God's word, if he were to open it up and he were to read a passage that says, if you love me, go out onto the street and do a handstand for five minutes. He said, well, I would, I would close my Bible. And I'd go out on the street and I'd do a handstand for five minutes. I'd figure out how to do a handstand for five minutes. If I don't know how to do a handstand, he said, listen, I, I, in that moment, if you were asked to do this in God's word, you're going to wonder like, why? This doesn't make any sense. It doesn't seem safe to go in the middle of the street. Uh, it doesn't seem uh, reasonable. People are going to look at you weird. Like, why is that guy doing a handstand in the middle of the street? It's not going to make sense to you how that's helpful in the long scheme of things. It might not make any sense. It might not be something you want to do. It might be humiliating. It might even be something that you're not very good at. I don't know if I could do a handstand for two seconds. <laughs> but if God's word says that this is one of the ways you, you show love to God, and that we're ought, we ought to show love to God, then I'm going to learn how to do a handstand in the middle of the road. Now, God's Word doesn't tell us to go do a handstand in the middle of the road. It has other things in it. And so simply put, if God's Word speaks, we have, we have Jesus's authoritative Word. We know how to, you know, what's true and what's not, based simply on what God says is true and what's not. His Word can be the filter at which we put all the ideas through and, and see what comes out on the other end. I've heard people in, in ministry as a pastor, I've heard people say things like this to me. Here, here's an example. One woman said, I've met my soulmate, the person God wanted me to marry. And so I'm going to leave my husband. I mean, that'd be like a real simple one, right? Like, hey, let's just process this thought through the Word of God and see what comes out on the other end. And that clearly wouldn't have come out on the other end. That idea wouldn't have, have passed through the filter and, and filtered out as the right choice. How about this? Here, here's one that, that we hear a lot these days, right? I feel certain, uh, a certain way about my body, and so this must be what God wants for me. Hey, let's take that idea and process it through the Word of God. What comes out on the other end? Because it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter if this other person gives you the, you know, the uh, warm fuzzies that your spouse hasn't given you in years. It doesn't matter. You just process it through God's Word, every message through the Word of God, so that you don't get deceived. Here's number three. Number three is listen to the Holy Spirit's voice. Listen to the Holy Spirit's voice. You see, listen, believer, if you're in this room and you've given your life to Christ, Scripture is really clear that you have received this gift of the Holy Spirit. You have the power of God living inside of you that can direct you and guide you. The Holy Spirit is that advocate, that guide that can direct your steps. Let's look at how Paul says this in verse 11. He says, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised. He says, but not by a physical procedure. Remember, these are Gentiles. The, the church in Colossae, these aren't Jewish people. They weren't circumcised physically. They were circumcised spiritually. He says, Christ performed a spiritual circumcision 
the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him, you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Now, in this passage right here, in these two verses, there's a lot that's covered. But ultimately, what, what Paul is saying is, listen, when you gave your life to Christ, you, you died to your old self. You received this incredible gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and by the way, you had to die to your sin nature. The old sin nature has to be cut away for the Holy Spirit to come and live inside of you. You know, what was the Holy Spirit's previous address before he started dwelling inside of men? It's called the Holy of Holies. So through Jesus' death on the cross and, and you accepting that gift, you're, you are made holy and righteous before God and the Holy Spirit is now able to live inside of you, cutting away your sinful nature. It says you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. This, this process of baptism, this initial step of obedience, it's all tied up into this process. So I think about it. You know, you probably said something like this in the past where you've, You've told someone you made a decision and you just made it based on your gut. Have you ever said that before? I just had a gut feeling about it. It just made sense. I, or maybe intuition is the word you used. I just kind of felt like it was the right decision to make. And sometimes when we say gut feeling or intuition or it feels right or whatever, what we're really saying is that the Holy Spirit has given us a peace about something. We actually are listening to the Holy Spirit and we just sometimes don't know how to, how to phrase that or what to call it. Sometimes, though, think about it. Have you ever had, like, a, a really weird dream, and you wake up the next day, and you realize that you ate something, like, spicy at night, and that always, I don't know about you. If I eat something too spicy right before I go to bed, it'll jack up my dreams, man. I'll have some really weird dreams at night. Anybody else? You just, you've connected weird dreams to something you ate? Well, here's the, here's the warning I want to give you. If we want to uh, listen to the Holy Spirit directing us, one of the things you got to make, make sure you're paying attention to is sometimes you'll, you'll have a dream or you'll be thinking a certain way or feeling a certain way, and, and you're like, you know what? I guess that's the Holy Spirit speaking and giving me direction and helping me not be deceived. That might be the case, but sometimes it's just bad lasagna. It's just an idea that popped up in your head because of something you saw on TV last night, and it has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. So I want to I wanna process through this thought for just a moment. How do we learn to listen to the Holy Spirit's voice and to tell the Holy Spirit's voice from our own stream of consciousness? How do we tell the difference? And I will tell you, it's, it's very difficult for many people. Some people it comes easier, but it is something that can be learned. I'll give you an example. This past Monday, our overseers at ACC, we, we had a retreat together planning out 2025. And then on Tuesday through Thursday, our executive pastoral team, we went on a retreat together to take the vision of the overseers and really lay that out for next year. Uh, and, and so we, we've been uh, doing a lot of planning this week. But on, on Monday night, all of the overseers and their wives, we gathered together for a meal. And I asked one of our overseers' wives, who I respect deeply. Her name's Marcella. She's an incredible woman. I asked Marcella, Marcella, what did you do today? It was Labor Day, right? So everyone kind of had the day off. Marcella had the day off. And so I what did you do today? And she said, you ready for this? She said, I prayed and I worshiped. I remember just sitting there because I'm going to be honest with you. Maybe you think that because I'm a pastor, I spend like eight hours a day praying and worshiping. But that's a struggle of mine. I have a hard time praying for more than 10 minutes. Anyone else with me? Like when you pray, you're like, all right, I'm out of things. I said all the things on my list. Uh, talk to you again soon. You know, and like, like, and so I have a hard time praying for a long time. And so when I, I'm t hearing Marcella telling me that she spent the day in prayer and in worship, I just acknowledged, I said, Marcella, I'm so, I'm just so encouraged when I meet someone who just has that gift of prayer, where they just love just spending time in communion with God and conversation. And I said, I have a hard time. I run out of things to say. And this is what she said to me. She said, Matt, you know, sometimes, in fact, the bigger part of prayer is just listening. 
She encouraged me that I don't have to just be the one who does all the talking in prayer, that I can just be quiet and listen to the Holy Spirit's voice. One time, um, it was about nine years ago, I was on a missions trip in Guatemala. And the missionaries there that were hosting our team, they said they were going to start, they, they were going to have this moment where they're practicing what's called intercessory prayer. And I said, well, listen, I don't know a lot about intercessory prayer. Will you teach me how to do this? And they said, sure. Essentially what we do is they said, we're going to sit in this room quietly for 30 minutes and just listen for the Holy Spirit's voice. Like, so you don't want me to pray in my head or pray out loud? No, don't pray out loud. Definitely don't do that. Don't pray in your head. I don't want you to say anything. I just want you to sit and listen to the Holy Spirit's voice. I said, listen, I, I'm, I'm not good at that. Like, that is not my strength. How am I going to know? They said, just, just try it. I said, okay. So for 30 minutes, I sat there. I remember uh, it probably took 20 minutes for me to try to get rid of all the distractions in my head. And even then, I thought, certainly I'm not doing this right. And at the end of the 30 minutes, the plan was to gather everyone back together and say, what did the Holy Spirit ask you to pray for? Instead of praying for what I want to pray for, Simply for 30 minutes, asking the Holy Spirit, what do you want me to pray for? What have you put on my heart to lift up back to you? And, and so I knew we were going to gather back together. I'm thinking, I got to have something to say. I don't want to be the one person who's like, nope, got nothing. The Holy Spirit doesn't speak to me, right? And so I'm sitting there. I, I finally, I think, got to a point where I'm like, okay, I'm, I, I got two things I could share. But I seriously, I don't know if it was me or the bad lasagna. I don't know what it was. And so we gather back around in a circle afterwards, and before we begin to pray together, everyone's sharing what they felt the Holy Spirit said to them. And I said, okay, well, the first one, uh, please don't laugh. I said, please don't laugh at me, because I, I felt like the Holy Spirit put a name on my heart, but it's not a name I've ever heard of before. I don't think anyone's actually named this name, but I know it's a name. I'm like, well, what name was it? And I said this name out loud. And I said, does anybody know this name? Now, one of the missionaries that was in the circle with us, they were, at the end of the year, they were moving from Guatemala to China. And so they had hired a Chinese tutor to teach them Chinese that year before they left. And they raised their hand and said, that's the name of my Chinese tutor. I said, okay, well, we're supposed to pray for him. Okay. They're like, well, now they're in, engaged. They're like, what was the other thing? <laughs> you just thought of a name out of thin air. I said, well, I had a, like a picture in my head, and I wasn't sure if I was just distracting myself or what, but I saw this volcano. We were at the base of a volcano in Guatemala, and I said, I pictured it erupting. I'm like, all right, well, we don't know what that means. It hasn't erupted in, you know, a long, long time, but we'll, we'll pray. I, I, I promise you, <laughs> we, um, we got in the plane and left that trip, and while we were still in the air, when we landed, there was a report of that volcano erupting, and our base camp had to evacuate. And um, I was just thinking, like, whoa, like, what, what in the world? This is something I probably should do more often, like, just learning how to listen to the Holy Spirit's voice inside. Now, remember, though, sometimes you get a, a word or a thought, and you're like, I think this is the Holy Spirit leading me and guiding me. And sometimes it's just bad lasagna. And so we have to Go back to rule number two. If someone comes to you and says, you know what, I listened to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said I'm supposed to leave my husband and go with this other person. You just circle that back to rule number two because God will never contradict himself. He's not going to tell you one thing through his Holy Spirit and tell you something else in his word through Jesus. He's not going to do it. And so we know that the word will always trump the feeling that you got inside the guiding that you think is the right thing for you. Always process it through the word, but also lean into listening to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will help you tell deceit from lies if we learn to listen to his voice. All right, here, here's the, the last one. Number four is don't let your past cloud your judgment. You know what Satan wants to do, and this is probably one of his favorite ways of distracting you from, from understanding the truth and living in truth, is to constantly cloud your vision, uh, 
basically speak so loudly that you can't hear the Holy Spirit speaking, speak so loudly that you don't have, uh, you, you find yourself not able to spend time in God's word to just to cloud your judgment by making you relive your past sins, by speaking them loudly over and over again. So you're just sitting there living in guilt and shame. And so here's what Paul encourages them to do in verse 13. He says, you were dead Because of your sins, and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. But then God made you alive with Christ, for He forgave all of your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Isn't that an incredible promise? Simply put, you were dead because of your sins, but because of what Jesus did on the cross, you're not dead to your sins anymore. That's all in the past. It says that they are completely, he forgave all of your sins. He canceled the record of charges against you. You don't need to stand in shame and guilt because of your past anymore. In the Old Testament, Isaiah 54, verse 4, it says it like this. Fear not, you will no longer live in shame. Don't be afraid, there is no more disgrace for you. For you, or you will no longer remember the shame of your youth and the sorrows of widowhood. Simply put, what many of us in this room need to do in order to to not be deceived, we need to to take the heavy burden that you're carrying on your back right now, that rucksack, the the rocks, the weight, or whatever it is, and you just need to drop it at the foot of the cross and say, you know what? Jesus paid for this already. I don't need to walk around with this. I don't need to be reminded of this. I can move on past this because I want to see clearly so that I can tell when an idea that's coming in from the outside world, I can tell whether or not it's true or it's a lie. You got to get rid of all that. Lay it down. Drop it. You don't need to carry it anymore. It's been paid for on the cross. All right, here's what I want to ask everyone to do. Grab your your note sheet and flip it over. And on the back side, you're going to see at the very top there, it says, what now, God? And in our what now, God moment, if you're new to ACC, we simply ask the Holy Spirit right now to prompt us with what we ought to do this week and in the days to come to be more like Jesus. In light of the truth that we just read, we know that we don't want to be deceived and so in doing so, we want to, you know, we, want, we simply want to take these steps, right? We want to become unoffendable with our roots growing deep. We want to compare every message to the Word of God. We want to listen to the Holy Spirit's voice. We want to not let the past cloud our judgment. What do we do? Now, some of you, I know, when I say, what now, God? You, you're kind of like, all right, the sermon's over, and you've already clocked out. I haven't even read the last verse yet, and it's my favorite verse in our passage. So, Bear with me for just a moment, okay? Here's some questions I want to prompt you to think about. Maybe one of these questions, the Holy Spirit will give you something specific to write down on your your notes. Number one, what can you do to grow deeper roots? Is there something that the Holy Spirit is asking you to do or spend more time in his word, spend more time in prayer? Is there something specific that you need to do to grow deeper roots? How about this? How are you intentionally developing your knowledge of the Bible? Wouldn't it be great if we knew this book so well that when an idea comes into our head, we can compare it to the Word of God without even having to open the Word of God? When somebody says something, we just say, I already know enough about God's Word that that is a lie and I'm not going to believe it. So something maybe you could consider doing is taking a Discipleship 101 if you're a brand new believer or our apologetics certificate program, or going to some growth courses and just learning more about God's word so that you can spot lies right when they happen. You can be like, that's a lie, that's a lie, that's true, that's a lie. Here's another question. When was the last time you practiced just listening to God's voice? Maybe God's asking you to to exercise this practice of just being still And instead of having something to say every time you go to him in prayer, just listening to his voice. Or or a fourth question, what burden or shame do you need to drop at the foot of the cross? Is there something that's clouding your judgment right now that you just need to leave behind so you can move forward? Now let me show you my favorite verse that we're going to 
In this passage today, the very last verse, you're never going to see this uh, the same way again. All right, Colossians 2.15, it says, In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. So Jesus uh, has disarmed, it says, the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Now, do you see that, that word, he disarmed them? That word disarmed in the Greek... It's a Greek word, apek duomai. And apek duomai in the Greek, its literal translation is, it says he, he stripped them. The way I would love for us to all see this verse, every time you read Colossians 2.15 ever again, here, here's a better way. It says, he went up to the, the bully who is trying to whisper deceiving things and lies into your ears, was trying to convince you to just back down and fall over. He went up to that spirit and pantsed him. <laughs> the God that's bigger than the universe itself that created all things walks up to the deceiver who's trying to bully you and deceive you and just publicly disgraced him in front of everybody. That's this kind of access we have to God the Father. He loves you so much. He says, listen, if you pick on my kids, I'm going to publicly disgrace you. And so it says he disarmed. I, mean, I, I promise you, if you've ever been pantsed, you are disarmed in that moment. <laughs> Completely disarmed. And Jesus has disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He has shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the access we have to your word and the access we have to your Holy Spirit living inside of us. We want to be a church that can recognize the truth from the lies. We don't want to be so easily deceived. And so we recognize that if we grow our roots deep and we, we build them upon you, that we can grow strong and tall and become unoffendable, not so easily knocked over. We can stand up against the bully of the lies of this world. And in doing so, as the wind comes, we can process those things through your word. We can process those things through the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And at the end of the day, we can be sure that our, our judgment isn't clouded by our past mistakes. We can do things right the next time. And God, we thank you for these truths. Help us to be a church that lives in truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC.